It's the Weekly Show with David J. Maloney. This week, David talks to filmmaker Iran Kolarain. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome to everyone at home, and I would normally say our studio audience to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. Uh, I say normally because we'd usually shoot the show before a small studio audience at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. Uh, but we are still shooting our last few shows from home due to coronavirus protocols. So, in Milton, Florida, a 33-year-old man was arrested for having sex with a dog, or as he called it, man's best friend with benefits. You know, this gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, give the dog a bone. By the way, the suspect denies committing the act, citing he'd never cheat on his cat. Oh, and scientists have discovered a ring of fire on Venus, which is highly preferable to a ring of fire on Uranus. And rapper Lil Pump has been accused of owing $1.6 million in back taxes. He's blaming his accountant Lil CPA. Vice President Harris is losing support from her own party. To give you an idea of how bad it is, today Willie Brown said, eh, Kamala was just okay in the sack. To give you an even better idea of how unpopular she is, her new Secret Service codename is Mel Gibson. A mom in France was arrested for dressing up like her daughter and trying to take a high school exam in her place. Yeah, school officials became suspicious when she couldn't silence her iPhone. And lastly, in southern Germany, an armed man hijacked a bus full of Japanese tourists. Police were able to apprehend the suspect quickly, however, after being provided 3,597 photos of him. On tonight's show, we've got a wonderful filmmaker who first made his mark on the international film circuit with his film, The Band's Visit. His latest film, Let It Be Morning, about a man and his family trapped by a military blockade inside a tiny Arab village in Israel, played in this year's prestigious Cannes Film Festival. Here to chat about Let It Be Morning is award-winning filmmaker Aran Coraline. So stick around, and we'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, our featured guest tonight is an award-winning filmmaker whose film, The Band's Visit, garnered international acclaim and whose current film, Let It Be Morning, is Israel's official entry in this year's Academy Awards. Here to chat about the film is its writer and director, Iran Kolarin. Thank you for being on the show, Iran. How are you? Thank, you? Thank you for having me, David. I'm good. Before we talk about Let It Be Morning, I'd love to talk a little bit about some of the things that made you who you are. Um, where did you grow up and, and what was life like for you there? Oh, I grew up in Tel Aviv uh, in the 80s, which was more, you know, it was the smallest city then, more like a uh, more homely and uh, small community. Then I lived most of my life in Tel Aviv. You're an accomplished filmmaker now, but where did the love for cinema kind of initially start is there a, is there a memory that you can trace it directly back to i remember first of all it came from my father i think he was uh, uh, also a director in, in himself and a film editor so i grew up sitting next to him while he was editing you know on steinbeck film still so uh, uh, and every friday he would made me make me watch like the, the the American film we had on TV, which, you know, were a lot of Hitchcock films there. He was a big fan of Hitchcock. And uh, so in some way I grew into it. It was quite natural to me to think about frames and movement and camera and dialogue. You've lived through a, quite a few momentous historical events in the Middle East. Do you see your life in Israel as having made you a different kind of filmmaker than you would have been if you were born, say, maybe somewhere else? I don't know. I think the films I do are connected very much to the reality around me and the reality that I, at least I understand or I think I understand or I think I have my own specific point of view 
you know, starting from the architecture of, of, of you know, the land that I come from, to the stories, to the conflicts, to politics, to everything, because, you know, it's natural for me. I'm part of this place. So I don't know if I would have been growing here in LA. So I might have had other interests in, you know, the films. But I don't know those hypothetical questions. I think there's something be- beyond all that, a certain sensibility or a certain certain thought, specific kind of thought that you have, which is you, basically. <laughs> did becoming a filmmaker seem like kind of a feasible option for you growing up, or did your family want you to be something else entirely different? Oh, my, my family wanted me to be a lawyer. I actually, actually studied law for like three and a half years, just failing before the end uh, uh, because it wasn't for me. I mean, I, I was still searching for myself in many ways. I didn't know who I am, what I was, and I was studying law because it was a respectable uh, whatever. But I became much less respectable. Uh, So was there ever a point in your journey where you thought, "Ah, geez, you know, this, uh, maybe this isn't going to work. I I may have to find a different job. I mean, I know for a lot of filmmakers, there's often kind of a moment like that. Almost, it seems like often right before their big breakthrough. Did you have any of those moments? No, uh, I I think, I think, first of all, I have I think every, even every filmmaker I met, at least, we have this feeling, you know, every film we finish, because every time you finish a film, you know, you don't know what's going to happen with it. You don't know what's your next project. You're always in front of this abyss, thinking, well, maybe I'll work in a small restaurant somewhere if I don't have money, or I mean, and I think uh, those kind of fears are even growing bigger. <laughs> uh, this is maybe the reason why you can sometimes hear about those ultra successful people who are still, you know, doing terrible things, keeping, you know, climbing to a certain climax that is never there. So you're always on the verge of thinking. And actually it is, you know, all men's work are at the end of the day <laughs> are doomed. So uh, I think these fears are, to be honest, part of life. And um, of course I had this feeling, uh, you know, before your first project, you're more of a, I mean, it's usually the beginning of your life. So you're more, uh, you, you tend to have those these kinds of thoughts later. I see remnants of your first film, The Band's Visit, in the subject matter found in Let It Be Morning. Do you see similarities between the two films? And, and I mean, was that something that you were drawn to or am I reading too much into things? No, no, I think definitely in terms of style and tone and the combination of humor and tragic and pathos and... Uh, tension and you know this uh, all 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 in a very closed set that is uh, sometimes turns into this little uh, theater of absurd you know so I think this is this is like all of my film have been around this area but I had more abstract films like The Exchange which was much more you know uh, artistic film I would say and I had Beyond the Mountain and the Hills which was uh, more uh, tragic and hard, and I think the band's visit and Let It Be Morning are kind of uh, a combination of, uh, and I, th- I really think that the Let It Be Morning is like a culmination of a lot of different emotion found in my films, and especially the band's visit. Yes, so um, uh, yes, I do think there's. Great resemblance, uh, or great connection, not resemblance. I don't recall much controversy around the band's visit itself. Um, Did you expect to have any controversy with that film? Uh, To begin with, there was also, you know, around the band's visit, there were a lot of uh, uh, debates and conversation, and I believe this is actually a good thing for a film. I don't do film to evade... uh, I mean, I don't do films 
to do something in spite or make a controversy in spite. But I think, you know, once I touch those subject matters, once I do it the way I do it in the special uh, human uh, assembly that I'm doing it, whatever, it draws people to a discussion, which I'm I'm very happy for. And I'm, I'm proud about that. I mean, this is what films are supposed to be doing. So, um, but I, I'm not going into film thinking, oh, I'm going to have a controversy. No, I'm going into film thinking I like those characters. They touch me. I like the story. I find myself in it. I can say something with it. I, I feel it in my heart somehow. This is what gets me. Well, let's chat about the, the new film, Let It Be Morning. Uh, what's interesting, and, and you, you touched upon it, is that with this film, you were approached by Sayed, uh, is it Kashua, right? Sayed about Kashua. making it. And for those who don't know, he's an internationally acclaimed author. Did you know who he was already? I, I, I mean, I'm sure. I, I mean, did, did you have any preconceived notions or opinions no. about him before you met him? Yes, of course. Said is quite famous in Israel. He had a column in the paper, a very funny observation of the life in Israel from a Palestinian point of view. So he was very well known and... And he had a very, he has still a very unique position, uh, telling his own very unique uh, story of uh, being in between cultures and, you know, in between the system. And of course, I knew him. I didn't know that specific book, which he offered, the Let It Be Morning, his second book. I didn't know it. Um, but I was happy, of course, to read it. What made you decide this would be your next film? I mean, you didn't have to make this one. I mean, you could have probably done countless other things that may have been potentially on your plate. What made you decide this is the one to do and do it at this time? There was something about the book that drew my heart. There was there was something there, this, this state of siege, the state of closure. Uh, what, it, what does it feel like? And not necessarily why or, or, you know, reasoning or, or, you know, arguing about it, but just going for what is the state of mind of the seizure and the besieger, the closer and the one that's been, what is the, what is the human state of mind, what's going on? And I, I, I really, I really felt there was something uh, there that drew me. I could see the film poster. I could see an image, like in my head, when he when he said the story is about, you know, a small village, a Palestinian village inside uh, the Israeli territories. I mean, those are Palestinians with uh, who are civilians who are uh, citizens citizens of Israel, and suddenly the the one day the village is closed off. Um, it was very unique. It's it's it struck uh, it struck, strikes very specific uh, gray area in the in the existence here, and uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> it, this one took time. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it. <laughs> As you mentioned, this I th was the first film you've done based off somebody else's work, because you said you normally write alone, and then here is this person with a second with a second. What was the experience like with Syed, and and what did you learn, I guess, about the film and his story in those conversations? First of all, the the process with Syed was very welcoming and easy. I mean, he, at a very early stage, said. Listen, listen, take it, do whatever you feel like. I, I'm not going to, you know, stand and check. And I I send him some uh, drafts along the way and I send him some uh, rough cuts and he, sometimes he gave some remarks, but um, he wasn't totally involved in the, uh, in the script writing. And uh, then, of course, I finished the film. I was very stressed to know how it felt because... I took myself some great liberties sometimes adapting his stories because I felt, you know, it needed to transfer to the screen in, in yeah. a different way. But sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's not easy for writers. And uh, I was a bit stressed about it, but he came back, said he loved the film, and I was very relieved that uh, he liked it. And... Um, and I, I, I believe the, the film is like a nice companion to the book in a way that 
it's, it's not it's not an, a necessarily a staging of the book but it's like a conversation with the book of two you know um, of two different people talking about the same kind of stories they tackle it from sometimes the same angle sometimes different angle I always told myself that I can do whatever I want but I need to stay faithful just for the spirit of his book and I think he appreciated that. Did you know what you were getting into when you agreed to do the film? I mean, you, I mean, did you already know? Listen, when you, uh, this one you kind of knew was probably going to lead to some controversy, no? Yeah, listen, you know, when Syed approached me and said, listen, I have a story in a Palestinian village uh, in Arabic, uh, you want to do it? You know, it sounded like a public suicide. I'm not, you know, I'm not ob oblivious or I don't know about, the, the the you know the discourse these days around identities who's doing whose film who's doing why I mean you know I'm I'm pretty aware and well read <laughs> on this kind of uh, on on this discourse but I don't know I mean what is worth unless you sometimes go with, with a certain spark in your heart because uh, this was a beautiful welcoming on his behalf, saying, you know, come do this book. He could have chosen anyone else. I mean, so I, I think that that was, you know, a kind, of, a kind of place that you don't ignore just because public discourse or, or general ideas, which, I mean, it's a specific, very specific, and for me, very beautiful case, which, you know, I felt it worthwhile to put, put like you know seven years of on my of my life on realizing it. I mean it's a, so um, so you know I knew that all those the, uh, the discourse was coming. I knew I'm going to get attacked from the right side in in Israel, and you know very quickly after we uh, won the Academy Awards in Israel, there was. Uh, you know, criticism by a mem member of the parliament saying this is Palestinian uh, propaganda, you know, and 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 saying I was another uh, writer say, said I was anti-Shemic. But this film, I think, honestly, when people see it, I mean, it's such a, there was something happening there, so truthful and so, I think, for me, full with love. So when you were casting for the film, how did you go about choosing your actors and actresses? I mean, based on both the subject matter and everything else, was it was it an easy or difficult process? Well, first of all, I met Juna Suleiman, who was really my close partner on this film. She's a very good friend, very talented director on, on her own. Uh, and she and I approached her to cast the film. Uh, the, the, the script was not as good then, you know, I still didn't finish the script. We had some conversation on the script. But the first thing she said was, you know, you have to take Alex Bakri on this film to play the main role. And I said, Who, who's Alex Bakri? I never heard his name. Did he play any? He never played anything. So he said, uh, she said, no, but he is my ex-boyfriend and he's perfect. I know him. <laughs> so I met Alex and of course he, He's from the Bakri family. He has, uh, you know, Muhammad and Adam. He has their beautiful looks, but he also, you know, connected very much with the spirit of the character. I think in the film, he really became close to the characters. We we went on shooting, and we were looking also for her, uh, his partner. Uh, and then uh, the last day of uh, auditions, when we didn't find an actress, Juna, the casting director, told me, you know, I could do it better than all of them. And I said, well, you're welcome, let's see. And she said we were just uh, doing the, um, you know, the matching uh, session with Alex. And they said together, and it was obvious, you know, it was obvious that they're a real couple that she's fire and he's like air and water and she's earth. And there was this thing going on there, which is specific for couples, which, you know, is there on the screen. As a filmmaker, what would you say was the most challenging thing about bringing this specific story to life? I think the hardest thing is, is to find, for me, is to find the right tone 
of the film between its sincerity and it's when it's joking and when it's uh, hard or, or you know there's a specific mixture in the film which is uh i don't think you can say it's either you know comedy or drama or where it stands but you need to have all those little moments and and those different overtones to somehow walk in harmony to make the special tone of the film that's always i think always the hardest thing having come out on the other side of post-production has the experience been what you expected it to be you mean when i saw the rough cut and yeah uh, yeah and and obviously the final the final the final product did it did it meet your vision because i know that you said you took some liberties so you were hoping it would meet enough of syed's vision but did it did it come together the way that you yeah i mean I would, at the beginning I, i'm i would never have released anything unless i was completely sure it works the way i want to want it to work that that's what editing is for and that Well, you have to do it until it's it's finalized it's it's plays like I can the way that I like it you know I don't know but that it plays for me in the right way in the right music of things so um but you know a rough cut is always a terrible experience I don't know if you met any director ever who told you you know I saw the rough cut it was perfect and I went uh <laughs> To my next project usually you watch a rough cut and you go like oh my god how i'm gonna tune this thing now because you just feel you're just watching an untuned orchestra playing <laughs> and then you start slowly to tune so the the film's got a u.s release date coming up in 2022 um what do you hope that audiences in the u.s will take away from this film You no, know, I felt that people were were missing this kind of quiet uh, drama that throws you slowly in that you know makes you wonder. So I do think this I hope at least the tone of this film, this specific combination of being funny, being dark, being in in its own certain space and 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 pace and you know rhythm. It's something that people might want to see within all the mess the you know the hectic mess that's going around it's like uh, so I hope a lot of people will found will find this nice sanctuary you know for two hours in our how does it feel for for let it be morning to be Israel's official entry in this year's Academy Awards? I mean where were you when you found out and and who told you it was happening No there was a, there was a ceremony it's an academy just the same way that it goes in uh, US you have like 300 500 I don't know academy members who are professionals from the uh, film and television usually in Israel and they select out of the film produced in that year the film that you know wins so there was a ceremony I I knew just when I was in the ceremony and they they called me to the stage so, so I went <laughs> Aaron thank you so much for joining us ladies and gentlemen Aaron Corlin thank you very much bye lady that's our show for tonight a special thanks to Aaron Corlin for joining us and thank you so much for watching stay safe everyone